thank you for coming tonight. Um, just wanted to say thank you for coming out. Um, let's see. Hazing and alcohol abuse have been an issue in college life. These issues have resulted in serious injuries and even death. Tonight, we have two very special guests joining us, Rayanne Groover and Evelyn Piazza. These two par parents are here today to tell you their son's stories, Max Groover and Tim Piazza, because their sons are no, are no longer with us. They died after being hazed in their fraternities. Last June, Christopher and I heard their stories while we were at Ruck Leadership Institute, which is a summer program for our fraternity, Sigma Phi Epsilon. After that presentation, we were able to connect with Rayanne and Evelyn for the first time. Ricky and I heard the presentation again at SIGEP's Grand Chapter Conclave in late July. That is when we knew we had to bring this presentation to Trine University. As you will hear from our guests today, when hazing and alcohol abuse are prevalent, the consequences can be tragic. And these parents have paid the ultimate price. Our guests will tell you about how their lives have changed since their sons, Max and Tim, walked into a fraternity house expecting brotherhood and got something very, very different. Rayanne and Evelyn travel the country telling their stories, raising awareness to the issue we have in this country. Hopefully, after hearing this presentation, you'll take away that hazing should not be present or tolerated in any organization. With that being said, we're honored to introduce you to Ray Ann Groover and Evelyn Piazza. got this right. Can you guys hear me? Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having us here. And Ricky and Chris, thanks so much for doing this. They, we've worked a lot with them over the last couple of months to make sure that this happened. And we're very happy to be here with your community. Um, during our time together tonight, we're going to talk to you about hazing, what hazing looks like, what to watch out for, and what you can do to keep yourself and your friends safe. Hazing should not be a part of your college experience or the college experience of any of your friends. This presentation is an honor and loving memory of our sons, Max Gruber and Tim Piazza, who died as a result of hazing in their fraternities. Good luck at your first semester of college. We hope that you have a great first year at school. Have a good time and learn a lot about yourself. Make new friends and have fun. Make us proud and study hard. Make good decisions and be safe. Love, Love Mom, Mom and Dad. Dad. This is an ABC News special report. Tonight, a major new development in the alleged hazing death of Penn State student Timothy Piazza. We have new evidence. Surveillance video that authorities say was once destroyed, now recovered by the FBI. This is the video that they clearly did not want seen. Guess what, guys? Now we know. Prosecutors say the footage from the basement of the Beta Theta Pi house shows fraternity brothers giving the 19-year-old pledge at least 18 drinks of beer, wine, and vodka, all in just an hour and 22 minutes. Death of Timothy Piazza hits very, very close to home for the Graham family. Their son, Marquise, just 18 years old, when he pledged the Phi Sigma Kappa house at Penn State's Altoona campus back in 2013. The Bram family says Marquise was under a severe amount of psychological stress after months and months of hazing. Ultimately, Marquise took his own life on March 14th, 2014. Ten young men under arrest in the suspected hazing death of a college student in Louisiana. The LSU freshman died after attending a fraternity pledge event called Bible Study. Here's ABC's Steve Osinsami. 19-year-old Max Groover died after what they call the Bible Study September 13th. 
Pledges were asked questions about the fraternity, and police say that Nawkin and two others forced them to drink 190 proof alcohol when they got the answers wrong. A coroner's report tonight says that Groover's blood alcohol level was .495, six times the legal driving limit. Police say he was passed out on a couch for at least nine hours, that they checked on him during the night, and in the morning he woke up with a weak pulse. Max, let me tell you guys a little bit about my Max. Max was a gentle giant, a sweet soul. He had a big smile and an even bigger hug. And he was always someone who took care of the people around him. He was easygoing and super laid back. He laughed with his entire body and he loved every day of his life. Max was born and raised in Roswell, Georgia, and is the older brother to Alex, who's about to be 19, and Lily Kate, who's 15. He went to Blessed Trinity Catholic High School, and he dated a beautiful girl named Blakely all four years. He loves sports, journalism, and rap music. I know more about rap music than most moms. I know everything about East Coast rap, West Coast rap, all kinds of stuff, and Max had me fall in love with J. Cole, Drake, Kendrick Lamar, and as Evelyn knows, I love Schoolboy Q. Um, I do, I love collard greens. Um, <laughs> Max also wrote sports articles for Def Pen Radio, writing over 360 articles in just three years. And even this past weekend when Kobe Bryant died, I Googled Max on Def Pen, and sure enough, Max had written a bunch of articles about Kobe. And I'm sure he was greeting him this weekend when he got up there in the big sky. Um, but he could talk your ear off about any sport and every single statistic to go with it. He was a little league coach, and he coached his sister's basketball team. He chose LSU because he loved the journalism program, and he knew he had a lot of possibilities ahead of him. He had a bright future, one he was ready to go after. He pledged a fraternity to meet people and to get involved at a really big school, and he was also interested in a fraternity where he could take on a leadership role. He had even been up for pledge class president. Max was ready to start the next chapter of his life, but the next chapter of his life would be very short-lived. We dropped Max off on August 15, 2017. This picture is the last picture I have of my son and I. It's a moment I will never forget. It's a moment that many of you probably had when your parents dropped you off, especially that very first time. It's the last time I felt his arms around me, giving me that huge hug. It's the last time I saw that enormous smile. It was the last time I was able to look at him in the eyes, tell him I loved him, that I would miss him, and that I was really, really proud of him. I told him, this is your time. Go shine your light on the world. 29 days later, my son would be dead because of alcohol hazing in his fraternity house. According to police reports and trial testimony, pledges were summoned to the fraternity house for Bible study. They arrived at 10 p.m. on a Wednesday night, and their phones were taken from them. Some brothers descended down the stairs to where the pledges were playing pool, and one said, Are you all ready for Bible study? Y'all better do well, because I'm already effed up. The pledges were then placed in a single file line and they were marched up the stairs as they were doused in hot sauce and in mustard. They were placed in a dark hallway with a flashing strobe light and loud blaring music, clearly intended to disorient and distract the participants. At one point, the pledges were made to do wall sits while brothers ran or walked across their legs. At another point, a pledge was accidentally struck in the eye with a bottle, causing a severe black eye and laceration. But the big part of the night was Bible study. Pledges were placed with their noses and their toes against the wall, and that's when the questions began. Answer a question wrong about the fraternity, or mess up on the Greek alphabet, and you have to take a pull off of a liquor bottle. The liquor of choice for this Bible study was diesel, and a pull is taking a swig off until you are told to stop while brothers are screaming at you and telling you how many seconds to take that pull. Some pledges were forced to drink up to 10 seconds from those bottles. Max was one of those pledges. And as I think many of you probably know, diesel is not just alcohol. It is what is called a high-potency alcohol. 
It's an alcoholic beverage that is 2.5 times stronger than the alcoholic beverage that's more familiar to the average person like rum or vodka. This particular alcohol is 190 proof alcohol, grain alcohol. The alcohol's own website includes this warning and I quote, diesel 190 proof is extremely potent and should not be drunk straight, but integrated with drinks in a small amount. According to witnesses, this pledge activity lasted less than two hours, and Max was forced to consume 16 to 20 pulls off of those bottles, which has been calculated to be over 32 ounces of grain alcohol. He was forced to take significantly more pulls than other pledges because he got answers wrong, and he had been late to some other hazing events, and certain fraternity members had singled him out. They singled him out. The actions taken by these hazers resulted in my son's death. Near the end of the event, Max was observed to have a puke bag tied around his neck, but the hazers decided to make the pledgers, pledges recite the Greek alphabet as they went down the line, each one saying one letter of the alphabet, and if anyone messed up, that person had to take a drink and then they had to start back over. Every single time they got to Max, he messed up. He couldn't remember Upsilon. It was the only letter of the Greek alphabet that he had to remember. Upsilon. But with a puke bag around his neck and obviously clearly intoxicated, the hazer still made him drink five to six more pulls off of those diesel bottles. Max was taken back downstairs and left to sleep it off on a couch. And even with obvious signs of distress, no one called 911 to render Max aid during the night, something which could have possibly have saved him. The brothers observed him during the night with labored breathing, with cold, clammy skin, with his lips and his fingers turning blue, and a weak pulse. Some even checking his pulse and checking his breathing throughout the night. If you are checking a person's pulse and checking a person's breathing, you need to be calling 911. My son died at some point the morning of September 14th. He did not wake up in the morning with a weak pulse like that news report claimed. The autopsy showed that Max died on that couch between 4 and 5 a.m. And the brothers were more concerned for themselves and them getting in trouble than about saving my son's life. And in testimony and in statements, it was stated that they cleaned up the house, they got rid of most of the diesel bottles, and they even cleaned up Max. And by the morning, when students were in their classes, the brothers called Max's pledge brothers, his best friends, to come get him. Everyone was in such a panic that they convinced the pledges that Max still had a weak pulse. And then they told Max's pledge brothers to lie about how they found him and where they found him and lie to the hospital. And then they had four of Max's best friends pick up his dead body and put it in a car and drive it to the hospital, never calling 911 or allowing anyone else to call 911. Max's blood alcohol concentration was an alarming 0.495. I say alarming because this is six times the legal limit at which a person is considered legally impaired like a DUI. Even more alarming is that a blood alcohol of above a 0.31 is considered life-threatening. Can you really call this a brotherhood, subjecting your new members to life-threatening hazing rituals like this? Tragically, my son died as a result of this alcohol hazing Bible study. He was left to sleep it off in the fraternity house with his brothers right there. And the outcome was fatal. The coroner cited the cause of death as acute alcohol intoxication with aspiration. Max choked to death on his own vomit. 10 fraternity members have been arrested on criminal charges ranging from hazing to negligent homicide, which is a felony. Four were indicted by the grand jury Two pleaded no contest, which is the same as a guilty plea in Louisiana, and they were sentenced in July 
and spent 30 days in jail, which at the time was the, old, the most they could get under the old law. The individual who was charged with negligent homicide faced trial this past July and was found guilty. He was sentenced in, in November to a maximum of five years in jail. He started serving his time last week on January 17th and will spend two and a half years in jail and then have three years of probation. He was also being charged, and I think this is important for you all to know, with obstruction of justice for deleting over 700 items off of his phone. This charge was recently dropped in exchange for him dropping his appeals about the negligent homicide and starting his jail sentence last week. Again, I think it's important for you to know this because he would have been given another five years in jail when that trial was over and he would have been found guilty. So many lives have been ruined because of hazing. But most of all, our family has to live every single day without our oldest son, a brother, a grandson, a cousin, a boyfriend. This is not the college experience that we, or I think any of you, are looking for. Tim. Tim was an amazing person with an incredible sense of humor. He was shy until he got to know you, and then he was larger than life. He was smart, athletic, loved Netflix and video games, and he kind of had his life figured out. He was going to major in mechanical engineering so he could have a career designing prosthetics, go to grad school, eventually marry his high school sweetheart, and just have fun with his brother and friends. This is our last family picture taken together at the Rose Bowl on January 2nd in 2017. That year, um, the Rose Bowl was on the 2nd, not January 1st, because it was a Sunday and they couldn't compete with the NFL. And the 2nd happens to be my anniversary. And Tim had asked us when Penn State qualified if we could go to the Rose Bowl. And my husband said, sure, we'll make a trip out of it. It's in Pasadena, California. We live in New Jersey. We'll, we'll take, you know, the week. And Tim said, no, I have conditions. I need to be home on New Year's Eve with my girlfriend. And I need to come back the day after the game to finish out the week with my winter internship because they're relying on me. So we went to California for not even three days. And it was the best money we ever spent because it was our last vacation together, our last picture together. And in a month's time, Tim was dead. Tim was a part of his girlfriend's family. He was the big brother to Caitlin's younger brother and sister, and he was there for them if they needed him or wanted him for anything. At Tim's wake, Caitlin's dad spoke and said that he couldn't have created a better boyfriend for her and that he completely trusted her in his care, which was huge. He, he was a cop, so that was great to know that he completely trusted Tim. They were and are still devastated by his death. Tim was a big guy, and he took on the role of protector for anyone who needed it. He was a great friend, brother, and boyfriend. He brought lightness to any room, making people smile and laugh. My favorite picture is the one to the right. That, to me, is pure contentment. They truly were perfect for each other. So now I want you to put yourself in our shoes. Who here has a brother or sister close in age to you? close enough to be in college at the same time as you. If not, consider your best friend, and consider that you're both going to the same college. Now, close your eyes, and imagine that your brother's gonna pledge a fraternity, and it started last night. You get a call from your brother's roommate saying, he didn't come home last night, and that's not like him. He always comes home. You decide something's wrong, and call the hospital to see if he's there. They say, yes, there's been an accident come right away. You rush to the hospital and you see your brother on life support, neck brace, bruises and blood on his body and head. The doctor tells you it's bad, that he has a subdural hematoma which is bleeding on his brain. His spleen is ruptured, actually shattered. He has a punctured lung and he needs a blood transfusion because as it turns out, 80% of his body's blood is in his abdomen. You have to call your mom to tell her 
that the doctor's going to call, but that your parents need to come now. You tell her what little information you know, that it was the first night of pledging, and that he fell down the stairs. They need to medevac him to a trauma hospital one and a half hours away for neurosurgery immediately. You talk to him, even though he's unconscious. You tell him to hang in there, that you are proud of him, and that you love him. A tear rolls down his cheek, and you think he heard you. And then they take him away. Now, picture your mom and dad getting that phone call, as well as the call from the ER doctor. The doctor says, he's a very sick boy, but they don't understand what he's hinting at, that their son is dying. It doesn't click. Both mom and dad have to drive 45 excruciating minutes from work to get to home to pack bags, and then drive over two hours to get to the hospital where he'll be having surgery. Your dad says, this better not have anything to do with that fraternity. And your mom tells him, it was the first night of pledging. They call the police to find out what happened. There's not a lot of information, but they say he fell down the steps once, maybe twice, after drinking. They get to the hospital and feel sick when they see the helicopter still sitting outside. They rush in and have to wait in the surgical waiting room. Finally... Someone comes to take them to surgical ICU to meet with the surgeons. It turns out this man is a chaplain, but it doesn't click why a chaplain was sent to get them. In a small room, a surgeon and a nurse tell them that their son's brain injury is non-recoverable. They feel the world stop. Another surgeon comes in and explains that once the skull was removed to release the pressure on the brain, The brain kept swelling outside of the skull, and that this is considered brain death. They try to comprehend what's happening. He's brain dead? How can this be? Is there any hope for recovery? He's still on life support. No. They have tests to prove brain death, but they can't be done because of his other injuries, and your parents have to take the doctor's word for it. You get a ride with your roommate to the hospital, and find out how bad it is from your parents. You try to be the strong one. His girlfriend comes with her dad. They have to tell her that the boy she loves is brain dead. You all cry together. Then you finally get to see him. The only skin showing is his shoulders. He's covered with blankets to keep him warm, but his body won't warm up. His head is covered with a white gauze stocking cap to cover the bandages from having his skull removed to release the pressure on the brain from the bleeding, and he's got bruises and swelling on his face. He's on a ventilator. There are IVs everywhere and machines monitoring his oxygen level and body temperature. They need to put chest tubes in his lungs because his oxygen level's dropping. They think he aspirated on vomit. The doctors and nurses are telling you that they're doing everything they can, but that it's just a matter of time. He's going to go into cardiac arrest. The organ donor person is talking to you about donating his kidneys, the only organs not damaged. Now, you all have to decide whether to resuscitate him when he goes into cardiac arrest, potentially breaking ribs in his already battered body, only to know that he will go into cardiac arrest again. Or, do you let him go into cardiac arrest and die? so they can take him into an operating room and harvest his organs? Or do you turn the machines off now in an operating room and let him go so they can harvest his organs immediately? You, your parents, his girlfriend and her dad decide to turn the machines off, but he codes before you can tell the doctors. And they resuscitate him. As you watch from the hallway, a nurse pulls your mom forward and tells her to kiss her baby goodbye. He goes into cardiac arrest again, and you all let him go. You and the 10 medical personnel in the room who look at you with sad eyes. And there it is. He's dead. It's 1.23 AM. A day and a half ago, he was alive and happy. How did we get here? How did this happen? What happened at that fraternity house? This doesn't make sense. He was a good kid. 
He wasn't a risk taker. He wasn't a drinker. He was a good student. He had a longtime girlfriend who he was planning a future with. He had great friends and roommates. He had plans for his future at school and for his career. What happened? He was an amazing person who was hazed. And then once he was hurt and unconscious, was slapped, had beer poured on him, had a sternum rub done to him, had his shoes thrown at his head, was sat on to keep from rolling off the couch, was backpacked, and then basically ignored and left to die because the fraternity did not want to get in trouble. Think about this being your loss. Think about this being your pain. Think about having a funeral and having to watch your mom put his urn in a niche at a mausoleum. Think about you losing your best friend, your only sibling. Why? Because he was hazed. Everyone's lives are forever altered, and there will always be this hole in your heart because he was hazed, got seriously hurt, and no one was willing to do the right thing and call for help for fear of getting in trouble. So let's begin with the definition of hazing. Hazingprevention.org defines hazing as any action taken or situation created intentionally that causes embarrassment, harassment, or ridicule, and risks emotional and or physical harm to members of a group or team, whether new or not, regardless of a person's willingness to participate. No new member should be subjected to any hazing activities in order to join an organization. And you have to remember, a person's willingness to participate does not matter. The person is trying to prove themselves to you. They are made to believe that they have to do these things in order to be part of your organization. I want you to ask yourself these questions. If you think hazing is happening to you or to one of your friends or to anyone in your community, is this causing emotional or physical distress? Does participating in this activity go against my values or the values of my organization? Is this activity illegal? Am I being asked to keep these things a secret? And why are you being asked to keep them a secret? If a faculty member or an administrator or an advisor walked by and saw what you were doing, would you get in trouble or would you be written up or would something happen? Would you do these activities around your parents? Would you even tell your parents that you were doing these activities or that you were doing them to someone else? How would they react to that? I want you to ask yourself if you would do any of these things to your own self or to your own sibling. If the answer is no, then why are you doing them to someone else? Hazing can start off small. It did with Max. You know, he had to wear khaki shorts and a polo shirt. That was supposed to be his pledge uniform um, for the six weeks of pledging. You know, maybe you're asked not to shave your hair, your, your shave your hair. Maybe you're not asked to shave your beard or girls, maybe you're not asked to shave your legs or you can't wear makeup or guys, you can't cut your hair during that six weeks. Maybe you're asked to buy a brother or sister cigarettes or vapes or tobacco. That happened to Max too. He was forced to get someone else's car because he didn't have a car at school. A brother made him come get, bring, get, get him in the car, take him to a convenience store, and then Max had to spend like 60 or $70 on vapes and cigarettes and all that kind of stuff while he was being smacked around in the car and hit upside the head. Um, maybe you're running errands for brothers or sisters or cleaning apartments or doing laundry. Um, but it can progress, and it can progress quickly. Like I said, the cleaning the apartments. Um, maybe girls, you know, pledges are made to come to your house, the guy pledges, and they got to clean your apartments in their underwear or something like that. Um, you know... New members have to, oh, sorry, I just said that. Um, shooting pledges with aerosol guns. That happened in Max's case, too, and paint guns. Now we've just had a lot of reports. Um, there's a Kappa Sig group that in November, they shot with a real gun somebody in the leg. Um, you know, drink, here's another one I just heard. Drinking Sprite and eating bananas, and then you have to throw them up, and then you have to eat the throw up off the ground, like a dog. That's what dogs do. Um, Sexual favors, asked to do lap dances for fraternity members, being blindfolded, being locked in dark rooms for long periods of time, 
Um, again, a lot of mental and psychological abuse, body shaming. Women, you know, a lot of body shaming, mean girl um, things, exclusion. We just heard a story, um, a Sigma Chi fraternity got closed down last year at Richmond. Um, they were locking their pledges in dog cages with collars, naked, and then the brothers were peeing and pooping on them. Explain that to me, like how that's, you know, proving yourself and why you would be subjecting someone to that. But again, it can turn into fight nights, paddling, forced drinking like the gauntlet or Bible study with Max, doing excessive calisthenics, being dropped off miles and miles from school, maybe barely clothed, and you have to figure out how to get back to school. One of my girlfriends, um, she was telling me her husband told her a story that when he was in college, um, same kind of thing. They put him in their underwear. They put him in their, a trunk of a car with a quarter, drove him out to wherever, miles and miles from school, and then would drop them off, and they had to find their way back to campus. Now, you guys are old, younger than us. Um, they had a quarter to find, to find a pay phone because they didn't have cell phones and all that kind of stuff. So find a pay phone, and maybe that can help you get home in your underwear. So... Again, the point is you don't know where a hazing event is going to lead, and you are literally playing Russian roulette with someone else's life. You don't know how far someone else in your organization is going to take any of the, these events also. And I hear this a lot, and Evelyn hears this a lot. Just because you might not be using liquor to haze does not mean that it's not harming another person um, or that it couldn't be deadly, like we just explained, and Evelyn's going to go through several deaths later that happened and no liquor was even involved. Um, but it only takes one second, one person to push it all too far, one bad decision, and someone could be seriously harmed, psychologically damaged, or even dead. There are personal consequences to hazing. On the physical side, there are numerous traumatic brain injuries due to beatings, falls, and alcohol poisoning due to forced drinking. Hazing can be exposed when a victim's hospitalized. And also, you aren't taking a medical history before you haze somebody. So you don't know about their prior medical conditions. They may not even know that they have a medical condition. And you don't know what prescriptions that person's taking and what the contraindication is. Most of you, if you're on a prescription medication, do you know whether you're supposed to drink on it or not? You probably aren't. But nobody reads the small print on the things that, the packets that come with your prescriptions. So you don't know what you're gonna do and how it's gonna affect that person. On the psych psychological side, the negative effects are, are long lasting. This kind of trauma is not usually reported. It can include depression, suicide, poor grades, withdrawal, and shame. And you don't know if something in someone's life makes them highly susceptible to serious repercussions if they're hazed. Hazing can have long-term damaging effects to a person's well-being and their future. You may not be able to hold down a job. Your memory may have suffered. You may have developed addictions, and as we know, hazing can kill. Hazing is often about power and control. You will do whatever it takes to prove your loyalty and your commitment to that organization. Hazing is more than just peer pressure. It absolutely can involve bullying. Hazing, again, happens when you're under duress, which is why a victim's agreement to participate cannot be the defense. Hazing does not build unity and should never be con considered a tradition or a rite of passage for your organization. And hazing is a cycle of abuse where the abused later becomes the abuser. Just because it happened to you does not mean you need to do it to the next group of new members. You can stop the cycle. I have no doubt that some of you have hazed people. And I have no doubt that some of you in this room have been on the receiving end of that hazing. But from this day forward, you can change the cycle. Hold each other accountable and say no. Hazing is everyone's problem, therefore everyone is responsible. It reflects on your group, on your campus as a whole. So it's up to each one of you to stop it. It is not just about your chapter, again, or your organization. Your entire Greek system this reflects on. Your university of trying this reflects on. It is all about you. Think about LSU. 
No one is forgetting about Max, and everyone is talking about how bad LSU's Greek system is. They've got a lot to come out from. Penn State also, they have a lot to come out from, from underneath. It reflects on the entire university. Um, and hazing happens every day, and we used to only hear about it when somebody died, but that has drastically changed in the last like year and a half because we are hearing about it more. We are hearing about it every day. It is in news articles. It is on the news. People are being arrested, and it's because Young adults are not tolerating it anymore. You guys are standing up for yourselves and you are feeling empowered. And this last year has been a ample uh, examples of that. Just starting in January, and I know, I'm sorry I'm bringing up the LSU again, but you guys probably heard about the Deeks getting, um, 10 Deeks were arrested at LSU and their nationals is who reported them. They were doing things like making their pledges lie in beds of glass and then urinating on them, hitting them with lead pipes and kicking them with steel-toed boots, burning them with cigarettes, placing them in ice machines naked for 30 to 45 minutes, making them get on all fours and they would play dice or cards or whatever on them and if something fell they'd get kicked or again hit with lead, pipe, lead pipes. Um, several universities have you know, suspended or put on probation. Um, fraternities and sororities. Um, Vanderbilt suspended two in April, and Ohio, um, Ohio University closed down their entire IFC in October to investigate all of them because there were so many reports of hazing and so much going on that they closed it down, investigated, and then when they reopened, probably I think it was eight to nine of them were put on probation or suspension, sororities included, from the evidence that they found. Um, 18 were indicted at the University of Miami, Ohio for hazing. They were hitting pledges with spiked paddles. Spiked paddles. Um, FSU, a total of six, five have been in October and December, five have been put on suspension or probation for hazing. UGA suspended um, a sorority there. Um, just in January, University of Kansas, um, Delta Upsilon has been suspended. Again, I don't know what's up with the urinating on each other, but they were urinating on their new members and tying them up to well, it says an anchor outside of sorority. I think that we can figure out what sorority that is because somebody has an anchor. But um, Penn State, though, it's not just fraternities and sororities, and we know that. Penn State, just two weeks ago, four of their f football players and their head coach is under investigation right now for hazing. And you guys can Google what they were doing because I'm not saying it out loud. But it's also rugby teams. The LSU dance team was suspended last year. Club sports has it, business fraternities have it, glee clubs, bands. So it's happening in other organizations too. We have to watch it. And you guys all have to remember that hazing is against the law, and Evelyn's going to talk to you about the laws. Ooh, I did something, sorry. Oh, there. Sorry. <laughs> so there is no law in a handful of states, just in a few states. In a handful of states, it's like a traffic ticket with very little consequence. In most states, it's a misdemeanor of varying degrees. Hazing is a felony in 12 states, and both the Groovers and us were able to get the laws passed in Louisiana and Pennsylvania to make that felony. But unfortunately, all 12 of the states that have felony hazing laws had a death first. If your home state is not a hot pink or red color, and even though Indiana is, it is, right? Yeah. It needs help. Um, contact your local state senator and representatives and let them know that you want an improved felony hazing law or a felony hazing law in your, your home state. A couple of parents who lost kids to hazing got together with the NIC and the NPC and a couple of other organizations. We formed the Anti-Hazing Coalition. Together we put forth a model state legislation for a felony hazing law. We are happy to supply that to any state senator or representative who want to take up the charge. And quite honestly, it doesn't have to be a lot of people. We think that it, it means a lot coming from students. But in New Jersey, they are currently refining their existing felony state hazing law because the boy down the street from us, who was Tim's best friend's little brother, wrote a letter as part of a Boy Scout project and said, we need to improve the state's hazing law because I lost my friend to hazing. And the representative said, okay. 
and that's why we are currently going through legislation in New Jersey. So it doesn't take much. We tried last year in Indiana, and it fell through. We're not quite sure why, um, but speak up. Um, but we really feel that hazing as a felony will create change. The other thing is we need to give prosecutors the tools to prosecute and the judicial system the ability to hold people accountable. So everybody generally knows that a DUI is against the law, right? And that drinking and driving is bad. Yet some people still do it. Same thing with hazing. Everybody knows, you should know, it's against the law and that it's bad. Why do people drink and drive? Because they think they either have it under control or it's not that bad. Because we're not doing the alcohol hazing that Penn State did. We didn't kill anybody. We're, we're not that bad. But it used to be with drinking and driving that a police officer would pull you over and if you had an empty container of alcohol in the car, they would have you pour it out, and then they'd send you on your way. Somewhere along the line, a judge got tough and started enforcing the law, and then other judges joined. And nowadays, you will lose your license, you will get fined, your car will be impounded, you might end up in jail. It is serious business. We need hazing to be that way, too. And why do people do it? Again, because they think they're either not that bad or they can get away with it. And I can assure you that Beta Theta Pi thought that they had it under control that night. But they could not account for what else could happen. You cannot predict what possibly could go wrong. Nobody could predict that Tim would fall down the stairs. But you could reasonably predict that something bad would happen when you give somebody 18 drinks in less than an hour and a half. I'm sure Phi Delta Theta thought they had it under control the night that, that Max died. So you never quite have it under control, and it's always that bad. So the law in Indiana, even though there is felony portions to it, it's really not that usable. Um, it's really not that good. It only relates to bodily harm. And if you cause serious injury, it's a level six uh, felony. If you do it with a deadly weapon, it's a level five felony. I don't know what a deadly weapon is. I don't think it's identified in the law. So there's a giant gray area right there because a deadly weapon could be alcohol if used in a large quantity. And then on the school side of things, you can lose recognition. You could be suspended from the university. You could be thrown out of the university. And for your career, this could have huge ramifications. Look, you're here to further your future, to further your career. You want to make a, a good future for yourself. If you have a hazing violation on your record, and if it's a felony, that's going to follow you. Google anyone, Google our son's names, and you will see names and pictures of the people that are involved. This will follow them for the rest of their lives. You do background che checks when you interview people. They're going to see everybody what has what is in their past, and it's not going to be good. If you have two people with equal resumes, but you see that this one was part of a hazing ritual that potentially hurt or killed somebody, you're not going to choose that person. You have medical amnesty in this state, and what this means is that you can call for help for you or the victim you will be safe from prosecution, whether you're under the influence or not. So there really is no downside. Think about this. What if you don't call for help? What if something bad happens? What if somebody is damaged or dies? That's on you. That's on your conscience for the rest of your life. Or you call for help. You get that person help, mm. and you potentially save a life. The beauty of Greek life is that you get to choose your brothers and sisters. You should be looking out for your Greek brother and sister like you would your blood brother or sister, putting their health and safety and well-being above all else. 
always err on the side of caution and call for help. We've had to change this slide multiple times over the past year. It turns out you don't hear about a lot of hazing incidents. It doesn't make the news. There are no criminal charges. And sometimes it isn't until a family files a large civil suit that we hear about some of these deaths. In 2017, there were, we thought that there were four deaths because that's what hit the national news. We found out about three of them because their families filed civil suits and it finally made the news. It seems like th there's a hazing death every year since 1959, and it seems like in the past decade, the incidence of hazing deaths has gone up dramatically. It's, it's a challenge. It's ramping up from one group to another, from one university to another, or on Old Row, you see one group doing something, and you think, oh, challenge accepted, and you want to be on Old Row too, or one of those other sites. So it's getting worse in terms of danger, and harm. There were, essentially, in 2019, there were four deaths between January and March from hazing, and then there were five fraternity-related deaths in the fall. Only one of those, I can say with certainty, was not hazing, and that was, that was something completely different. And, and I'm going to go off topic, off of hazing topic, and I'm going to go into mom mode. Stop taking, not saying that you do, stop taking prescription drugs that aren't yours. This boy took a fentanyl-laced Xanax and paid for it with his life. He was going to take a Zanny to chill out, and so did his friend. His friend was fine. His Xanax wasn't laced with fentanyl, but Ivan's was, and he died, and his mother is devastated. So whether it's Xanax or Adderall or whatever, Stop. Just don't do it. It's not worth the risk. It's not worth your life. And then the other deaths this fall, I can say with confidence that two to three of these were hazing at Cornell, at San Diego State, and at Washington State. So it unfortunately is still happening. These are some of the recent deaths. And like Ryan was saying, some of these aren't alcohol. Some of these are sleep deprivation. Colin Wyatt was nitrous oxide ingestion. That's another one, whippets. Stop doing whippets. It, it causes people to asphyxiate. It's not, it's not funny. It's, it's not safe. Don't do them. Um, and it's not just Greek life. Robert Champion was part of the marching band, and he was beaten to death. Um, Marquise Braham committed suicide. So suicide is a very real consequence of hazing. He survived his hazing, and the next semester, he didn't want to be a part of it. He couldn't take it. He went home for spring break. He went out to lunch with his mother, and then he threw himself off of the roof of a hotel building because he couldn't bear going back to that. That wasn't who he was. That wasn't his character. And he felt like he was a part of something so, so bad that he thought the only out was taking his own life. But I do want you to notice how many times the word alcohol is highlighted. It seems like hard alcohol is the tool of choice in college hazing. And it's got to stop. It's killing people. Obviously, it's killing people. We know that there's a procedure called backpacking, and for those of you who don't know what it is, it's when you fill a backpack with heavy books and you put it on somebody's back so they can't roll over on their back and choke on their own vomit. The problem is, it does not work. When you reach a certain level of intoxication, alcohol poisoning, and it's called poisoning for a reason. Side note, if you're throwing up from alcohol, you've reached a level of poison where your body's rejecting it. But when you reach that level of alcohol poisoning, the body shuts down. So the reflexes are no longer working. The vomit comes up, but it's not propelled out of the body. And you will breathe it back in, essentially drowning in your own vomit. Like Noah Domingo, like Max Groover, like Andrew Coffey, like Nolan Birch, like Dalton Diebrick. It's happening time and time again, and it needs to stop. 
if you're thinking about backpacking somebody, if you're checking their pulse, if you're, you don't like the, the coloration of them, if you're checking their breathing, call 911. This is our new norm, and there's absolutely nothing normal about our lives since our sons have been taken from us. There's always an empty place at our dining room tables. There's always an empty spot at all of our holidays. We just had to celebrate. We call it celebrating, but it's not the same, obviously. Our third holiday without the boys here, the third Christmas, the third Thanksgiving, another New Year's. We had to roll into a new decade this time, and Believe me, all you think about is Max isn't here. Look at all that he's missing out. Tim, you know, he wasn't here. He's not here to see what his brother's doing. Tim and um, Mike should have graduated together this past May and should have started that next chapter of their adult life together. And, um, you know, Mike's now an only sibling. And on Monday, Max's birthday was Monday, and he should have been 21. And we celebrated. My husband and I went out and had a toast for our son. And, you know, some friends got together. We went and had pizza because that was Max's favorite. But, you know, he's always going to be 18. He'll never be older than 18 years old. And um, next week is the anniversary of Tim passing. It'll be three years for Evelyn since Tim was taken from her. So, you know, there's, there's always something that's coming up. Then it's going to be Mother's Day. Then it's going to be Father's Day. And your boys aren't here with you to be with you. And um, just everything changes in, in your life without them there. And then even for the siblings. You know, I, can, I don't even try to pretend that I know what my son and my daughter are going through. But Alex lost his absolute best friend. The boys were two years apart. Tim and Mike are a year and a half apart. And thick as thieves. Thick as thieves. And... Alex really lost half of his world. Mike lost half of his world. I mean, you know, imagine losing your sibling that you're so close to. And um, the friends and the girlfriends. You know, I know so many of Max's friends who have suffered from depression. They have insomnia, anxiety, severe anxiety. Some of them have had a drop out of school after Max died. A bunch of his pledge brothers and his pledge class, class had a drop out for a while and get, you know, psychological help for it, and they still struggle with it. The girlfriends, you know, Evelyn has said before that, you know, it's like they're a widow without that title. You know, they had all these plans and things, and who knows what would have happened. It's like that unknown that everybody has, and they have to get through it and move forward with their lives. Nothing's ever the same. So many people are affected by it, and it just keeps going outwards and outwards. And then financially, Evelyn, why don't you talk about the financial? You have a good way of talking about that. So you need to know about the financial ramifications of legal action. In our case, we went through eight preliminary hearings just to see what charges were going to be allowed to go forward to trial. So that, were, that was eight times that people had to be in court with their lawyers, travel, some of them from distances, hotels. Lawyers cost a lot of money a lot of money, and there's all that prep work going into it. And then, then there's the trial, if you get to a trial. A lot of them pleaded down, and so then there was a sentencing. For two individuals, they still have to go to court. One did go to court and was sentenced to hindering apprehension. Um, but again, you have to pay for lawyers. And then after the criminal side of things, then there's the civil side. And the whole point of civil is financial. Because if you can't hurt them, like, justice-wise, you can hurt them financially. And, or make a difference and make them take notice and make others take notice. So now you have to get new attorneys that cost a lot of money. And you have to explain once again why you're missing work or you're missing school because you have to go to court because of a hazing charge. And, side note, your insurance company, your homeowners that normally would pay out for a lawsuit, is going to take a step back and go, whoa, you pleaded guilty to hazing. That's a criminal charge. We don't cover intentional acts or negligent acts, so we're dropping you. Well, now the financial 
damages are on you or on your parents. So now this is coming out of your, of your parents' retirement. Perhaps they have to sell their house. And bankruptcy does not cover you under legal damages. You can't escape through bankruptcy. So I want you to put yourself back in our shoes. Because of hazing, life is on an alternate course. This is not the way it was supposed to be. You are now an only child. Your children won't have cousins on your side of the family. All the things you were supposed to share together, holidays, tailgates, at your alma mater, vacations, won't be happening. You lost your best friend, your confidant, your workout buddy. His girlfriend lost her future husband, their future kids, and the future life that they were looking forward to down the line. Friends lost the guy who would have been the best man at their wedding, one of the greatest people they ever knew, the guy who could make them laugh no matter what. Parents lost half their world and their greatest joy in life. Half of their heart is gone, and they feel that pain in their soul and in their chest every day. You wake up and think, he's not here, and you go to sleep thinking, he's not here. Little things can send any one of you into a tailspin, hearing a song on the radio, hearing his ringtone on someone else's phone, going to his favorite restaurant, playing a board game that he made way more fun than it really was, or just telling stories and remembering him. The destruction is far-reaching and forever. Hazing is unfortunately powerful and vicious. Before you haze, put yourself in this place and remember how much it hurts to have someone damaged or gone from your life. Don't be the person who does this to someone and destroys their family and friends as well as your own future and that of your parents. And in the back of your mind, consider that one day you might have kids. Would you want someone to do this to your child, your baby? Consider the consequences. Don't think it won't happen because it does. It did. And it will hurt so many people with the greatest pain imaginable. You are very loved. You may not hear it very often, but know that you are very loved. Your absence from people's lives would be devastating to them. Now remember, the person next to you and the person who wants to join your organization is just as loved by their family and friends who would be crippled by their loss. Please listen to us and don't haze. So what can you all do here at Trine to change any hazing that is going on in your campus. And it starts with all of you being leaders. Taking action takes courage, and it is not always the easy or the most popular thing to do. Again, speaking up will not be the easy choice, but it will be the right choice, and you may be saving someone's life. You have to say no to hazing. In Max's case, Witnesses noted that the hazing was getting out of control, but they didn't do enough to stop it. In Tim's case, three fraternity members also recognized that Tim was in danger and that someone needed to get help. And in both cases, valid concerns for Tim and Max were overruled by the hazers who were leading those hazing events. So let me reiterate, speaking up will not be the easy choice, but it will be the right choice and it may be saving someone's life. If something doesn't look right to you or feel right to you, it probably isn't. Always go with your gut and get help. Just because it happened to you does not mean you need to do it to the next group of new members. You guys can stop this cycle. Please report it. If you see an incidence of hazing or you hear about it, please report it. Report it to your nationals Report it to your leaders, report it to your Greek life, report it to your, your um, dean of students, but report it. Talk to your parents about it, a friend, and find out what the next steps are. You are always welcome to call Evelyn and I, and we will help you take the next steps. And this is so important. If you see someone in danger or you see someone in distress, always call 911. Do not play Russian roulette with someone else's life. The tone from the top of every one of your organizations is critical. You must set the tone that hazing will not be tolerated in your organization or on this campus. In Max's trial, it was explained to us over and over again that there was an official formal calendar and a non-formal calendar. And pledges were told, 
You don't have to do anything on the non-formal calendar, but pledge after pledge and brother after brother that had to testify, and that was over 30 guys, said that they all knew that it was expected of them to do all of those events on the non-formal hazing event calendar. And they were scared that if they didn't do it, they were either going to be cut or it would be worse for them the next time. Just because you say to your new members that it is not mandatory does not make it okay. It is still against the practices of your organization. It is still hazing. It is still against the law. And I'm going to say it again and again, a pledge's willingness to participate does not matter. They think they have to do it no matter what you're telling them. And if an alumni is encouraging any sort of hazing when they come back to visit or around your organization, you need to report it to your nationals or to your, your school, and you need to get it taken care of. Your alumni should always be your mentors. They should be guiding you and helping you to become better young men and women. And always remember that hazing is absolutely unnecessary for any one of your organizations to be strong. Evelyn and I want to challenge you guys here at Trine. What can you do to change the hazing culture that's here on this campus and in your organizations? How can you make each other accountable, not just in your chapter, but in all the other chapters on this campus? How can you encourage true brotherhood and true sisterhood in your organizations? You know, you guys have Rush and you guys bring in these new members under the pretense of brotherhood and of sisterhood and the values that you guys have learned in your organization. What I'm not getting is after you do rush and you hand out those bids, why would you then turn around and start treating these people basically like shit? Making them be ser servitude, however you would say that, servitude towards you, and um, harassing them, ridiculing them, forcing them to drink, forcing them to do calisthenics. Why do you feel that's a period where you now need to treat them badly? You just told them why they should be joining your organization. That's why you both chose each other during that rush part. Why now during the pledge part are they proving themselves to you in this way? What can you do instead of hazing? We were just recently at Vanderbilt and we were talking with the IFC guys and they were great. They were very open and honest with us and we greatly appreciated that. And one of the guys said to me, one of the reasons that hazing events land up happening is because it's just really easy. It's really easy to plan a hazing event. It's a lot easier to plan that than to actually plan a more structured organizational activity to be done. Well, stop taking the easy way out. Bond. You guys don't haze year-round. Generally hazing, right? It's like period of time. It's during that new member period. And then they get initiated. And I've heard many, many, many fraternity guys tell me, yeah, the minute we got initiated, it all stopped. It all ended. So what are you guys doing the rest of the year? What are you doing all those other months that you guys are bonding with the rest of the guys in your fraternity and the girls? I don't know why I'm just saying guys. I guess because guys are all standing here. But girls too, what are you guys doing? You know what I mean? So incorporate all that. Get to know these new members. Actually get to know them. You're not getting to know them by forcing them to do, other, do things. So just think about that. And then share with each other all your organizations, what you guys are doing and what might be working for the SIG apps that maybe the Delta Chi's could do or vice versa, but learn from each other. And then again, this kind of goes with this, I kind of went into this, but be leaders and make your chapter, you know, an example for all other chapters on this campus and share all that information. And again, work together to do all this. You know, every one of your organizations has an oath or a creed that you guys all abide by. I'm Greek. I'm an 80 Pi from Clemson. And I believe in 80 Pi. We live for each other. SIGEP, they have the Balanced Man Program. And they say, I believe in fraternity because it would have me strive in every way to li live up to high principles for which it stands. Teak, to believe in the cardinal principles of love, charity, and esteem, and to use them to guide my life. Phi Kappa Theta. Give, expecting nothing, therefore. Theta Phi Alpha, justice to each fellow man. Alpha Sigma Tau, I believe in fulfillment of self 
and will strive to contribute my share to the progress of mankind. If you all are living by these oaths and by these creeds, where does hazing fit in? The fact is, it does not. Hazing has no place in your organization if you are living by the oaths and the creeds and the values that your organization is founded on. And honestly, no matter what your oath or your creed is or what your, again, what your chapter does, you are the trying campus. And at the end of the day, it's all about caring enough and caring about each other on this campus. And that you all need to care enough to educate yourself and your members on what is right and what is wrong. You care enough to make sure that those around you are making safe decisions. Care enough to remove others from harm's way. Caring enough about each other that you don't have to demean people or demoralize them or ridicule them. Care enough to report when someone else on this campus is not caring. And care enough, again, to live the values that you committed to in your organization. I want to share with you guys tonight something we found in one of Max's journals the night before we buried him. It was from a paper he wrote on blessings when he was 16 years old, and the last paragraph ended like this. God works in funny ways. He does bad things sometimes because in the end they are good. Something bad can happen to you, but it may happen because it will make you better. He does bad, I did it that way. He, he does bad to ultimately create good. Our sons were no different from you all. They went away to college and they wanted to find a home away from home. They wanted a brother when they couldn't be with their brother. They wanted a family when they couldn't be with us. They just wanted to feel safe. So please, take these words of Max's back to your champ chapter and across the Trine campus and put an end to hazing. Make something good out of something that's been so horribly bad for us. Make this change happen. On the last day of class, in one of Tim's classes, his junior year of high school, the teacher had all his students write themselves a letter, and he would mail it back to them in five years. Sadly, Tim didn't live long enough to see this day. But his teacher came to Tim's wake, and he left us a manila envelope in the back of the church. And when we opened it up, we saw Tim's handwriting, and we were shocked. And then we were so moved by what we read. And it was... It was beautiful, but it was painful because he wasn't there to read it for himself. And he told himself, don't sweat the small stuff. Relax a little and enjoy life. Find happiness. Not everything is on a silver platter. You need to find what makes you happy. Contact old friends. Contact family more. I don't know how long any of us will be around, but cherish everyone. Cherish everyone. Everyone is important. Everybody... Everybody is worthy of being treated like they matter. It is not hard to be kind. So again, we want to thank all of you guys for being here tonight. And again, for Ricky and Chris making this happen. Um, we've distributed the Fly High Max and Live Like Tim wristbands. I saw a lot of you guys with them on already. There's a whole bunch more out back. So, you know, please take them, wear them, put them on your backpacks, put them on your desk. Take some for your younger brothers and sisters and share the boys' stories so that when they go to college, they, they know that they can be empowered to say no. But we ask that you wear them proudly, and please remember Max and Tim and what they represent. Max and Tim died because of hazing to join a fraternity. Making this hazing culture change will save lives. You guys can contact us if you ever need us on all this contact information from us behind us. Follow us on our social media. Um, really, we're here for you. You can reach out to us at any time. And Evelyn and I do. We wish you guys so much success in this world. You have so much to look forward to. Stay true to yourself and to your values. And please remember to always keep each other safe. Thanks, you guys, so much. And we'll take any questions you guys have, too. Thank you. Now we're going to move into a question and answer portion. 
Uh, anybody is welcome to ask Rayan or Evelyn questions about their sons or the topic of hazing. We have a few mic runners up front here. Uh, there's a couple mics up front as well. Uh, I believe, are there mic runners going upstairs? Um, let's see. Uh, that being said, I would like to start the question and answer portion uh, by first asking uh, Rayanne and Evelyn, um, what gives you both the strength to go around the country speaking upon this experience? Um, we, I just have to make it stop. I can't let, I can't let other parents and other families go through this. So I, I have to do this for Tim and make his death make a difference um, so that it, it wasn't in vain because um, it is the worst pain. You'll understand it someday when you have your own kids, but there is nothing more important than your child. It's truly what you live for. And to know that your child died because of hazing, which is really just meanness, that's all it is. You know, you know good from bad. You know right from wrong. You know when you're not being nice. And, and to have somebody die because somebody didn't care enough to get to know your, your kid and value their life is awful. So I just I need to make it stop. Oh, um, OK. Um, it really is from Max's quote. Um, that, I mean, again, we read it right, you know, two days I found it after he passed away and going through some of his stuff. And I knew when I found it, I ran to my sister, and we were crying. And I said, you have to read this. And, and we both just stared at each other. And it was like, we have to make a change. We have to do something. And, and it really is, you know, it's so senseless why Max didn't deserve that. None of, none of you deserve that. Tim didn't deserve that. It just shouldn't be happening. That's not how you treat people. And you gotta, we got to make something good out of something that is so bad for us. And, you know, Max is absolutely worth doing all of this and traveling around the country to hopefully save one life in this room. Or hopefully somebody looks at a wristband and is like, you know, holy shit, we need to call the police because, or, you know, 911 because, I, you know, I, I'm checking pulses and breathing and, and he's not reacting. And I remember Mrs. Groover and Mrs. Piazza talking about that, let's call 911. And, you know, Andrew Coffey's dad has a great saying, um, no one called 911 for Andrew, too. And he was literally in a room of, like, 60 people. He died alone in a room full of people. And Tom always says, he's like, I would... I want to be out at having a steak dinner with somebody because that guy called 911 and saved my son's life. And I absolutely agree with that 100%. You know, somebody intervening and doing the right thing at that time would have changed all these events in our lives. So that's all we're trying to do with you guys is, you know, really think about these situations and what's going on. Um, if there are any other questions in the audience, feel free to raise your hand and just allow time for mic runners to get to you. Um, being part of being part of a sorority, and I don't know if like you were as well. As of last year, I got inducted into AD Pi on my birthday. <laughs> we reeled her in. <laughs> Um, after what's happened to you guys, and it's so horrible, how do you guys not have hatred for sororities and for and fraternities because of what because uh, of the actions of those two societies did? Well, I mean, I, you know, I I was an eighty pie, like I said, at Clemson, and so my Greek life was fabulous. Um, we were literally like, I mean, I wanted to stay you know, a pledge because we were treated like princesses. I mean, you could barely open a door for yourself or you were always getting a gift from your big sister. Or, I mean, you were just treated like princesses. There was never any hazing. So it just didn't exist. And my, I mean, some of my best friends still to this day are my 80 pie sisters. And um, I just know how good Greek life can be and what it's supposed to be. And believe me, I get mad at Greek life. Don't, don't think I don't. I mean... I see a lot of the flaws, obviously, and I'm very mad about what happened to Max, but we have met over the last 
you know, two years, year and a half, so many great young men like Ricky and Chris and them coming up to talk to us and, and getting to know these young adults and seeing how passionate they are about making this change happen and keeping their brothers safe. And that's been huge in helping to get through this is, is, is interacting with these people that really do want the change. And Greek life does want the change. I mean, they're nationals. We're talking to nationals all the time, Siget nationals, 80 Pi, not, we're partnered with them, you know, Sigma Chi, like it's there and it just needs to be fixed. And hopefully we're helping that happen. And again, helping you guys make it happen because it's really you guys that need to make it happen. So. And it's not just Greek life. Yeah. I mean, Robert Champion was in the marching band. Nikki Cumberland was in the Texas Rangers or whatever, Texas Cowboys, which was a spirit group. Um, it's happening in high schools with football teams and wrestling teams and, you know, girls dance teams. And, you know, you'll hear, you're hearing more and more about it. And, and maybe that's because we're helping to shine that spotlight on it. But it's not just Greek life. Unfortunately, the most of the deaths are in Greek life. And there are parents who have lost their kids to hazing who want nothing to do with Greek life and blame Greek life and think that Greek life needs to go away. But we see that value. We see the Friends for Life, the future networking opportunities, just the whole, we see the benefit when it's done right. So we're inserting ourselves into the process to help make things better to make it what it's supposed to be, that, that great experience that everybody walks away from with a good, positive feeling. All right, thank you. Hi, so my friend just joined a frat, and every time I ask him questions about it, he always says like, hey, I can't answer that, like we have to, like I can't tell you. Should I be alarmed by that? Her friend, is joining a frat, and every time she asks him what he's doing, he can't answer questions, and should she be alarmed? Yeah, you should have, I mean, I would question it. I mean, it's, it's one thing, I, I understand we all have our separate, you know, what would you even call them, like, there's things we're not supposed to tell, like, it's supposed to be like what, like what we do like in rituals. initiation with 80 pies, rituals, like real rituals. Um, I would still ask, I would ask some questions, um, if, you know, kind of see, like, if physical things are happening, if he's being forced to do things. Um, like, does he have to be, pay attention. Does he have to be at the house? This is one, I know, you know, they say it's study hours from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and any time you're not at the house, or not at class, you have to be at the house. Well, nobody's studying from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and then you're being called back again at 10 o'clock at night. Kind of pay attention to stuff like that. See what his activity, act, you know, is like. Does he have to be at the house all the time? Um, watch for signs of him depression, um, sleep deprivation. Um, I would still I would keep asking questions, and if you really think there's something, I would definitely talk to somebody in Greek life, um, and maybe have them talk to that chapter and see what's going on. And maybe not ask for details, but ask like personal feeling, to, like, are you okay? Are, are you safe? Are, you know, are you comfortable with this process? Maybe if it's just yes or no, he could answer as opposed to giving details. Does that Thank help? You. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, hi, uh, up here in the back. That's okay. Um, oh. Sorry, it's a little far away. Um, First of all, I just wanted to say that I was very excited to come to this presentation because uh, me and a few of my brothers uh, from Acacia, when we went to a, uh, a meeting, actually the IFC represent, representative who was there uh, talked very highly about both of you. Um, and we were excited to see this presentation. Um, as a current recruitment chair and who's been helping out with recruitment, I've had to explain to parents um, that you know we're not going to hurt their kids and we don't do hazing and stuff like that. Do you think that there is ever going to be a point where the optics change enough that you know everyone, not just Greek life, but the schools and the parents and everyone can come together and have a conversation about this? And do you think that there are steps that you know even people not in Greek life or who aren't in an organization who just want to kind of start the conversation can have 
So uh, we stop have stuff like this happening. One thing, um, definitely universities across the country are, are doing a lot of different things. Not all, but um, Florida State, for instance, I use them a lot as an example. Um, they've done a lot of changes. It's after Andrew Coffey, so it is reactive to what happened, but they are staying very proactive now that this has all happened. And one thing which would be great for your university that you guys should definitely think about, like you're saying everybody coming together, even parents and Florida State started basically an anti-hazing committee, um, which has students from all organizations. Um, some faculty members are on it. I think parents would be great now that we just said you said that. Um, have a, you know some parent representatives on there where you come together, and you can talk about you know your community open and honestly, like we were kind of saying earlier. Um, what, what are what are good practices that are happening over in the IFC or in the Panhel or this chapter is doing this or club sports is doing this where you can come together and, and kind of figure some troubleshoot some of those things also troubleshooting how do you keep this conversation going because this isn't a one and done after we leave here tonight you all have to keep this conversation going we'd love to help you guys figure that out amongst your chapters again you guys go back to your chapters, and I hope you guys have a really, really serious, hard conversation about whatever's going on, whether it's in your own chapter or whether it's on this campus, and you talk about it and you troubleshoot together what you think you need to do to make the change happen, and then come together as your IFC, your Panhel, NPHC, I always get them, the letters all confused, but come together as the councils and work together then come together with your other organizations there's several things you can do to keep it going and then it needs to start again next semester and again you guys can do it so that's just some of my tips about it i do want to comment though i think it's great that you're speaking to parents and it's one of the things that i've been saying all along that um, that the Fraternity should be contacting the new member parents and saying, I'm your point person, and I just want to assure you, here's my contact information. One of my dearest friends called me up on Saturday, and she said, I can't believe I'm going to talk to you about this, but my son is thinking about joining a fraternity at Temple, and I'm scared. What, what do I need to, you know, what do you know about blah, blah, blah? And, um, and I said, I, I've never heard of that one before, but I'll look it up and I'll reach out to the Greek life director there. And so she said that her son talked to his pledge, like recruitment person, and said, look, I was good friends with Tim Piazza, and I'm not going to do anything that makes me uncomfortable, and I will walk away. And the pledge recruitment said, I want to assure you, we don't do that here. Here's my contact information. Have your mom call me if she's concerned. And she called me last night, and she says, I just want to let you know. He went, th they were called there the other night, and they made them dinner. They made them a great dinner, and they just sat around and talked, and he was thrilled. And so she was breathing a sigh of relief because it seemed like what her son had been told really is the case. So I think that it's really good that you have that conversation with parents as well. Thank you. Will you come talk to me after? Max's best friends are Acacias now at LSU, so I just want to tell you about them. Oh, yeah, yeah. sure. I actually know a few of the Acacians yeah. from LSU, so definitely. Yeah, come talk if you don't mind. They're so great. I hope you get to meet them someday. Thank you. Any other questions? You guys have really been great. And please reach out to us again if you're too shy to say anything now and you just have a question. You can, like I said, email us or whatever and we will get back to you. But um, we appreciate it a lot. So thanks everybody for being here.